Baldwin County Public School System, considered one of the finest educational environments in the entire state of Alabama, has a history beginning in the latter part of the 18th century. When his records indicate, Alabama's first public schoolhouse was built in the North Baldwin County community of Tinsaw in 1799. And at that time, nearly 10 years prior to Baldwin being organized as a county, the area remained geographically expanse. Agriculture served as king, and family farms dotted every section of the county. And in this era of extremely limited highway systems, individual communities built their own respective public schoolhouses, with the Board of Education supplying teachers to provide instruction. In the early part of the 20th century, the Baldwin County public school system boasted over 80 separate school districts, each with their own individual public schoolhouse. And as time progressed, marked with improvements in transportation and engineering, numerous school districts were consolidated into nearby areas, leaving us today with very few of the original and historic public schoolhouses, which distinguished Baldwin County, beginning in 1799, as the birthplace of Alabama's first public schoolhouse. This documentary, commissioned by the Honorable County Commissioners of Baldwin County and Honorable Members of the Baldwin County Board of Education, seeks to illuminate these few remaining and historic original public schoolhouses in an effort to pay tribute to one of the finest public school systems in Alabama. Located in South Baldwin County, Foley High School's essential history began in a one-room schoolhouse in 1908. Students in grades 1 through 11 came from Foley, Roscoe, Rosedale, Magnolia Springs, Bon Secours, Union, Yupon, and Mifflin to receive an education in the continually expanding building. In 1918, a two-story brick building was erected from which the first senior class graduated in 1922. Two years later, a new five-room building was constructed and the school was officially named Foley High School. As time progressed to the 1970s, the school was split into four separate schools, each with its own faculty, administration, and staff. The facility then built a new library, gym, and science wing for the structure. The year 1989 provided for a new Foley High School as the former became the middle school for Foley students and the former middle school supplied room for the fourth and fifth graders to leave the elementary school. Foley High School opened in its current location on Pride Drive in time for school to start in the fall of 1990. Today this location remains the home for educational enlightenment to many students in Foley and the surrounding area and continues to exist not only as a landmark in Baldwin County but as an important place for students of the community to learn and grow. That is Foley High School and it too was built in 1927 but it was not built to the standard school plan because of the influence of one local trustee and his, he was uh, Dr. Sibley Holmes. And to explain to you his influence on that building, we would have to go back to a previous building. It was the first masonry structure. It wasn't the first school in Foley, but the first mes uh, masonry building, which came to be known locally as the old two-story building, was constructed because the, 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 th the three local uh, town members who were school trustees were willing to stake their personal fortunes on uh, the bond issue. And Dr. Holmes and a Mr. Bowler and a Mr. Hoke personally signed the, the, their, their, it was like giving a mortgage on all that property to, to back the bond issue, the, the, the county bond issue that built that school. And uh, because these were such active people and they went to such great extents, extent 
to uh, gain a good school building. Their power as trustees and prestige as trustees grew to a greater extent than did trustees and, and other school systems. They had a, a little more power over their choice of teachers, uh, over all school affairs than, than did other schools. They, they just exerted more influence because they were just so interested in the place. But Dr. Sibley Holmes, being the physician that he was, maintained that many of our health problems in, in the communities were caused by the fact that school rooms were overheated. The average school room in those days had a pot-bellied stove in it, generally with a, a, a jacket around it, a steel jacket around it, so that it didn't get so hot if a child fell into it, he, he wouldn't be uh, fatally burned. It, but, and, and the majority of the women, uh, the majority of teachers in those days were women. And women didn't dress in those days as we dress nowadays. They didn't dress as warmly in winter. And consequently, the teacher was always cold, and the students, the students were overheated. They, it just generally occurred. You could, you could walk in a classroom in those days, a typical winter classroom, and uh, the teacher would be perfectly comfortable, and the kids would have the tongues out. And uh, Dr. Sibley Holmes said he wasn't going to build, a, wasn't going to have a school built where kids couldn't get fresh air and he wouldn't have inside corridors. He said that at least once an hour when classes changed, changed when uh, classes changed from room to room in a high school, uh, his, he wanted his kids to have a little bit of fresh air. And then the people that came along and were principal of that high school noticed that there was a tremendous, in, a tremendous difference in discipline in a class where kids could be outside as much as possible. Discipline in an enclosed environment is a problem in any school anywhere. Noise, confusion, if they're jammed close together. But we found that, that uh, we, could ha we could have lockers in close proximity to each other outside and the noise didn't bother anybody. And, 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 and to Dr. Holmes's satisfaction, at least once an hour they had a breath of fresh air. And uh, <clears throat> W. Callum McGowan was, was, uh, became principal of Foley High School during World War II. And he later became uh, superintendent of Baldwin County Schools. And he knew what it was like to serve in both kinds of schools. He'd been, in, he'd been in schools that had outside corridors, and he'd been in schools that had inside corridors. And when he was going to build them, he was going to build them like Dr. Holmes built them. And I followed him at Foley. And I followed not far down the line as, as superintendent. But in the meantime, I was in charge of buildings and transportation. And I believed in the the uh, outside corridors. And you can see that influence on all of the school buildings that he and I and we and, and the superintendents in between. We built schools, <clears throat> we built schools with, uh, with open corridors. And they had great advantages. But in later years, we learned they had disadvantages. Uh, the main one was when it became possible to air condition schools, it was very difficult to air condition the ones with outside corridors. If you, if you opened the door, your cool air escaped. And uh, there was such, so much more space that was exposed to the outdoors for radiation. It is much more expensive to, to air condition but on those old school rooms, we never had any problems with mildew and mold. And nowadays, when we are build, <clears throat> we're building schools, and we're building them with the idea that, that they will be 
climate controlled. We don't dare shut one down now for any reason. You can't, you can't shut one of our uh, new high schools down in the summertime if you do it mildews inside. And your, your, computer, your computers melt. So you, we have to maintain climate control 12 months in a year now. And so we're back to the expense again. So each, each system has its advantages. Right, right now, I, 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 Dr. Holmes would be horrified that our kids are in, in a, that many kids are in an enclosed space uh, six hours a day without relief to outside air. He would be horrified. But those of us who look back on the hot days and <clears throat> look at the cool rooms. And, but in the old days, we didn't have as long school terms. And we didn't try to operate schools in August nor June. Now we do because we can, because they are, because they are cooled. We take longer vacations than we did in the old days. But, but each, each has its advantages and disadvantages. Today we fight mold and mildew and upper respiratory diseases. And in the old days we fought heat, but we never had mold and mildew. So I'm saying that the construction of Old Foley High School, now known as Foley Middle School, and I understand will be uh, raised in a couple of years, it influenced architecture for the next 50 years in Baldwin County Schools because of the people who uh, moved from through Foley Schools and came into uh, school administration at the county level. Like most of the um, communities in Bowen County, the Foley schools began in homes. Uh, there were actually 88 to 92 school districts in Bowen County, and the Foley one was one of those school districts and had its own school board in the area. The schools were usually one to two room and were about two miles apart in the community. And the oldest building that we have in Foley is a 1907 wooden structure. And it was first a little bit north of where it's located today. And the building was a one through eight school to start with and then um, was moved to the campus of the high school area and is actually still in use today. Beautiful one room building that has served many purposes through, throughout its life. That building was used on the Foley campus uh, for grades 1 through 12 to start with. And in 1917, the local school board had some very forward-thinking members. Dr. Holmes was one of them. Mr. J.B. Foley was one. And their local school board decided to really build the best school in Bowen County. And J.B. Foley gave the land of, uh, for the school, which is located at the present location of the Foley Middle School. They built a two-story building, and the caption at the bottom of that building, written in beautiful white ink, says, the best school in Baldwin County in Foley, Alabama. The school served grades 1 through 12, but at the same time, the wooden building was being used sometimes for elementary classrooms, and then sometimes, mostly, it was used for the agricultural program. In fact, Foley had such an emphasis on vocational education and home economics, they were the first school in Bowen County to apply for the money from the Smith-Hughes Act, which was a 1917 act, and the school was actually named Bowen County Agricultural School. We are fortunate to have some of the documents and some of the memorabilia from the days when Baldwin County Agricultural School was the name of the school, and we have diplomas and we actually have the yearbook from the very first class, 1917, the first graduating class of 10 students. The yearbook was named the Satsuma 
which indicates the emphasis on the farming in the area. The local community raised $2,500 between 1917 and 1919 to purchase equipment to furnish the agricultural building. They um, bought tools for the young men to use and sewing machines for the girls to use in home economics. That is an amazing thing to me, that $2,500 was raised in a small little fledgling town in the late, uh, in the late part of the teens in, in 1900. In 1924, the population had grown so, and the school system, of course, was, was adding some funds to the local money at this time. In 1924, the one-story high school was built. Now, you realize that any school that's a grades 1 through 12 is called a high school. So when you say Foley High School, it means grades 1 through 12. And until very recently, one principal would actually be in charge of all grades 1 through 12, and then there would be teaching principals or assistant principals in charge of the different levels, even if they were housed uh, in a different building. But the one-story building that is uh, currently Foley Middle School was built in 1924. And Dr. Leslie Smith was one of the earliest teachers and principals uh, in the school who is able to tell us precious, precious memories of the days in the one-story Foley High School. John Snook was the head of the telephone company. And uh, John Snook was a unique individual. He was one of the brightest people that I've ever known engineering-wise. He was, matter of fact, I believe John was a genius in many ways. But John had his own ways of doing things. He was thoroughly frightened by the fact that his father, who had established the Gulf Telephone System in Foley, was left without any manpower during World War II to run his system. Only women were available during World War II to, to the telephone system. And John was convinced that there was going to be another war, and he was not going to be caught short. So he employed only female employees in his telephone system, and he taught them to do all of the things that men do, with one exception. The women did not have the strength to climb the telephone poles using the leg irons that you would just walk up a, walk up a telephone pole with. And he began to think about ways that, and, and, and machinery that led to the present bucket truck. And John had old, uh, all of his uh, 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 telephone equipment was uh, World War, uh, uh, surplus World War II material. And he had these old trucks with booms on the back of them. And he had it designed so one of his ladies, uh, one of his women could step in a little stirrup at the bottom and be lifted up with a boom. Uh, all over, most of the way up the telephone pole. Once she was up there, she could get off and do everything that men did, and then he would let them back down. Well, I had become principal at Foley High School in, in the fall of 1953, and we were building the, uh, the third new wing to the high school, just to the, just to the north of the present one. It's part of the school now. We were building it that summer, and the school's flagpole was in the way of the new construction, and it had to come down. And there was nothing in the contract about putting up the new flagpole. But I, being a new principal, I was going to have a, a, a flag flying uh, on the first day that I, that I opened my school. So uh, I got the janitor to dig me, a, uh, dig me a hole out in front of the school. And uh, he was a little overambitious. Instead of digging the small hole that I wanted him to dig, he dug one that would be measured by feet. It pro probably would hold a couple of cubic yards of concrete. And the idea was that we would, we would stick the pole down there and, and pour concrete around. I had an idea of a, 
of a bushel basket size hole, but he, he didn't know when to quit digging. And uh, I talked to the local contractor about some excess concrete that he might have that I wanted him to fill that hole with. He agreed that as a, as a goodwill gesture, he'd put up my flagpole. But the, the school was fast approaching, and, and, and school wasn't more than a week away. And uh, I got called away uh, to the county office uh, on a, for a meeting. When I went back, the flagpole had been put up in at least two cubic yards of concrete, but they forgot to put the roller on the top of the flagpole that would horse the flag up and down. So I have a bare flagpole up and from the cemented in two cubic yards of concrete. Well, the first thing I did was hire a little boy to see if he could climb it. But it was one of these graduated flagpoles. It was big here, reduced in size, and the last run up there was quite small. And when he got up close to the top up there, it began to bend, and I had to call him down. So I, mean, I had a dilemma, and I did what everybody else did in, in full at that time. When you got in trouble, you went to John Snook and asked him for help. I had, an idea, had in mind one of his boom trucks and one of his ladies that he would just lift up to that flagpole and put that, put that roller up there for me. Well, I started to leave school for lunch one day at noon, and this command car, which was one of his trans personal transportation vehicles, old Dodge command car, driven by three, driven by one of his ladies and another one on the front seat, and John sitting up on the back seat next to another, and they come bumping over the curb and drive up to the flagpole. And a, another one just like it comes from the other direction. And then a, a six by six truck arrives up and, and bumps over the flagpole. In a minute or two, I had every vehicle and all of the, the, all of the personnel for the whole Gulf telephone system assembled on my front lawn. And I went out, what's going on? I'm, I'm going to move your flag. I'm going to take your flagpole down. Well, John, how are you going to do it? Well, he said, I'm going to dynamite it. And he reaches in his back pocket, and he pulls out two sticks of dynamite. And uh, he's, he's got the caps in his, in his pocket. John, no, 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 we can't do this. No, 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 no. look at this old two-story building down here. That, it, and it's got a crack right down the center. John, you can't do that. Oh, no, no this is not going to be a problem. And about that time, another vehicle arrives. And out hops a couple of ladies, and they had this wooden box with a T-handle on the top of it. And another two come out with a roll of wire. And they go up here, and then another would jump out, and they start boring with, with augers and boring down under this flagpole. And uh, <clears throat> John takes his knife out, and he cuts the, cuts the, the, the dynamite in half. He's going to use two sticks, but he's going to use, he has a cut and fork, going to do it in four pieces. And uh, he gouges in that dynamite with his knife point, and he reaches in his pocket, and he pulls out this detonator cap, and he puts the cord out, and he bites it with his teeth and cr to crimps it, and then they start shoving it down in those holes. I'm desperate. And uh, that, uh, but finally, there was just nothing that I could do except back up behind the pine tree. We were not even going to have anybody flagging traffic. I thought I could at least flag traffic before he dynamited the building down. Well, everything is ready, and they back up a little bit, and down comes the plunger, and it said, poof. And that old block of concrete rose gently up transferred itself to one side, and that flagpole leaned gently over to the ground. Out hops somebody else with a hacksaw, and they go to, they cut that flagpole off, and then one of these big six by six backs up to that big chunk of concrete, lets down the boom, and they tighten down on it, and the front end of the truck is red up. Well, they backed another one up to it, and did the same thing, and lo and behold, the front end of that truck, yeah, they backed the third one up from the other direction. It's to that, and that time, uh, that was the magic charm. It took three trucks, three lifts, and between them, they cleared the ground with that hunk of concrete. And then that first truck 
went off down through the city of Foley, the streets of the city of Foley. Behind it, a, a two cubic yard concrete and two trucks being pulled backwards behind it. And they go off to the city dump. <laughs> but I had a flagpole in place with a flag flying the first day of school. At this time, the two-story building was still standing right next to the one-story high school, and it was used as an elementary school. It would be grades one through seven or one through eight, depending on the uh, student population at that time. And the old elementary building that was two-story was located where the library um, was later built on the Foley High School and later middle school campus. The uh, building, of course, had no running water. There were outhouses there. And there were wooden kegs that were kept in the hall downstairs with a spigot at the bottom and so that the kids would have fresh water uh, to drink. Uh, some of them said it was even cool, which I'm not sure about that. But there was an auditorium upstairs on that and was uh, used for many, many school events at that time. In the 1930s, the whole county, of course, was suffering from the Depression, but Foley, being the forward city that it is, took the bull by the horns and did a lot of innovative work in the 1930s to be able to provide this kind of uh, schooling for their children that they wanted. They applied for federal emergency public works funds, and a new agricultural and home economics brick building was built on the campus of the high school. There is a plaque on that building today designating that it was one of the uh, New, era, New Deal uh, era buildings and was designated as a Roosevelt project. Behind the school and next to the school, five acres were given by J.B. Foley to be able to build homes or houses for the principals and for teachers. Those buildings were rented to employees and were used to entice employees to come. There are still two of those buildings standing on the Foley campus, and one of the residents has been living in that building for many, many years. We moved in here. Like I said, the, the books, had, they had stored books in here for um, about five years, I think. So um, my husband can do just about anything. So later on, he uh, there was these floors in here and the floors in the dining room. It was just strictly, it was built like I guess most of older houses are built. And it was probably built, we're not really sure, I'd like to know when exactly, but probably in the 20s, well, I've been told probably in the 20s. But um, the, it was living room, dining room and kitchen, and then bedroom, uh, bath and two bedrooms and the floors were nice in here in the dining room they were nice they're hardwood floors in fact I think my husband said maybe the doors that of course were, the doors were painted white so we didn't know but he thought they might even been mahogany uh, the, they had two fireplaces and uh, both of the, the, the fireplace in the uh, living room had been uh, painted the uh, was with brick but it was painted white and the, what do you call the thing over the fireplace? The, the mantel <laughs> was, uh, it, was painted, it was painted white too. So over the years I had painted it and took the white paint and I think it's probably just pine in here. But um, like I said, the, the walls on, on uh, everything within the, in the uh, living room were like you know, school green. The floors were just, just, just regular bo like boards. And so uh, we put carpet down in here. This is the second carpet we've had. We had the first one for about 30 years, I think. Bud, Bud and the kids and I, we all helped put paneling in the, in the uh, uh, living room and, and wallpaper in the bathroom in the, uh, the, the kids' rooms. We, uh, Rusty actually lit, uh, stayed in the room that, uh, that I'd mentioned that Coach Mr. Rich's son had lived in. And in the middle room, Ricky put her baby bed in there first because, like I said, she was just tiny. But um, 
they're, the, the house is old enough that we know that they probably had a wood heater at one time in the kitchen because the, there were flues or maybe wood heaters. There was a flue in between Rusty and Ricky's room, there's a, and there's also a flue in the, in the kitchen. And if you can make a picture from the outside or get, see it from the outside, you can see there's three chimneys. Uh, they had covered up the two. We, we used the one in the living room, the fireplace in the living room, for about five years. And uh, they're separate, the ones between, there's, there's two fireplaces, one in the living room and one in the um, uh, dining room, but they're, they're not, you know, they're divided by brick in there. And um, I think the one, the flu, where the flues were in the children's room, I think they actually, at some point in time, came and put, covered them over. But they, they left this one so we could use it. And then my husband put a wood heater. Um, Goodness, I don't remember how long after we lived here, but he 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 built a wood heater, and uh, we use that for our heat. The the there are two floor furnaces that we use when we first moved in were gas, but we didn't use them after after a year or so. We we just went with the fireplace and then then the wood heaters. But that's what heats our our house. One of the most rewarding. I things about being here and living here as long as we have and my husband coaching here with with coach Smith and both of them being godly men and influencing uh, I've always felt like that a coach a lot of times could would have more of influence on a young person than even their pastor because uh, so many kids uh, look to to my husband and to coach Smith as uh, as a as a leader as a, as an example and I think that's one of the most rewarding things is when I'll start crying telling these. I'm sorry. I cry easily. You're going to cut that out, can't you? But uh, you want me to start over? But uh, one of the most rewarding things is that um, when, it, when they will come back and just tell them, you know, how much they appreciate. Uh, some of them, they looked at him like a daddy almost, that, that they were a, a father figure to appreciate some of the, you know, the 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 stand they took and that they were godly coaches and they always led them in the right way but uh, I've always told my husband I, he need to run for an office because everybody knows him no matter where we are uh, you know here or anywhere else there we have been some funny experiences where anywhere around this area he goes in and somebody will come in and coach Pike you know, somebody will come in, Coach Pye, you know, it'll be a student that he knows. But one time we were at a motorcycle, a Christian motorcycle rally out in, uh, out from Fort Worth, Texas. And we had just ridden our motorcycle, we'd trailered it out there, and then uh, we'd, we'd ridden out to the, to the grounds. And we just, just got off our motorcycle, took out, stepped off the motorcycle, took our helmets off, and someone said, Coach Pygott, and it was a boy that had gone to school here, actually, Bubba Blackwell, and he was actually on the program, but, but what in the world are you doing here? So in, in, anywhere we go, and that's happened in other places, we've been in the mountains or somewhere like that, and uh, somebody, we'll meet somebody we know, but um, they, like I said, that's always been, uh, to me, it's, it's very rewarding, the fact that, that I know that my husband has made a difference not only as a coach and as a teacher, uh, we've taken you know young people to church with us. We had to go travel all back in the 70s, and we'd load it up and take kids to church with us. And um, so that's that's been one of the advantages. I, when Ricky was little, when uh, like I said, she was only three weeks old when we moved here, and we'd go back then. They had just like little infant seats. And I would put her in the infant seat and take her to, you know, she went to, we never had a babysitter. They all went to all the, Rusty, and of course Rusty was usually out on the football field with his dad, but Ricky would sleep that first year, all the hollering, carrying on in a football st uh, uh, stadium. She would sleep through the whole game. But if we go to away games, um, we had a, a car where her little infant seat would fit right, right in between the two front seats, and we'd pile the cheerleaders. A lot of times we'd take the cheerleaders with us, and, and, uh, take them to the games with us. So. Well, me and my wife moved here in 1968, I guess, and uh, I taught two years down in Florida, and then I came back and uh, I went to an uh, alumni meeting. My old head coach at Southern Mississippi was uh, the speaker that night at the alumni meeting in our county, in Pearl River County, and uh, he asked me what I was doing, and I told him, and he said, well, give me your number. I get calls for coaches all the time. So uh, 
just a few weeks, Coach Ivan Jones, if you know anything about football in South Alabama, anyway, everybody's heard of Ivan Jones. So uh, he called me, and we came down and met with him and Mr. Rich and and uh, signed up and been here ever since. <laughs> a lot of... Uh, I had a lot of, I was, I was an assistant, and then Coach Jones left, became a principal, assistant principal at the middle school, and, and uh, Lester Smith was the head coach, and me and him coached together my, my whole time here, my whole time here, me and him were on the staff together. And so I was either coaching with him or teaching with him for 29 years, and he's, uh, he's high on my list of, of people. There was a lot of other people that came through were good people that, uh, had an abundance of them here at Foley High School, and he's he's up close to the top in my opinion. And we had uh, we had some colorful people that came through, and uh, 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 I was thinking one of the one of the stories I was thinking of uh, teachers that came through, Miss Rhonda Stringham, who's now I think she's at the county level. When her she first came to Foley, because she was so young looking, we were having an assembly in the gym, and. Uh, all the kids, and me and Barry Pennington were standing outside waiting for all the kids to get into the gym. And they all pretty much got in there, and we were standing outside the door. And uh, along here came, they'd already started, and here came this other person. And they kind of stood by us, and uh, Coach Pennington said, uh, there's a seat right in there on that first row right there. And she said, I think I'll just stand here. And he was kind of an authoritative. He said, you don't understand. I'm telling you to get in there and sit down. <laughs> and she said, but I'm a teacher. <laughs> so every time I see Rhonda, I think of that story. And uh, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of interesting things happened. Uh, of course, you know, when you're coaching, you're so caught up in the, the season. As soon as the season's over, you taking up the stuff, and you're looking forward, you're getting ready for the next season. It's just always, and you get caught up in that, and the years roll on by. <laughs> You know, and your kids, our kids grew up. Our daughter was, uh, Ricky was four weeks old when we moved to, uh, to Foley. And anyway, <laughs> and uh, now she's been teaching, I don't know how long she's been teaching math at the high school, and I'm married to Matt Moran, and he's, uh, we're, he, we're, we're really proud of our son-in-law. And our daughter-in-law, our son is two years older than her, and he, uh, <laughs> He, uh, I know my wife, when he started playing Little League Baseball, we went to one of the first baseball games he played in. My wife said, man, I didn't know these games were so exciting. <laughs> you know, uh, if you got somebody in, in the game, it makes it a whole lot different. You know, if you got a dog in the fight, it's a whole lot more interesting as to how it's going to turn out. And it uh, makes it more exciting. And, uh, and, and then we rocked on, and here we go. And... <laughs> The whole family's involved. My daughter becomes a cheerleader. My son's playing football, and I'm coaching. And my wife Claudia, she's up in the stands. So every game is just, you know, involved for everybody. <laughs> and those were some exciting times that we went through. Speaking of the people, you know, anywhere that you're working, that you can be, you feel comfortable with the people you're around. If you respect the people you're around, it just makes it so much better. And I, I hear people that are working in a situation where it's just, they hate to go to work. But that wasn't, wasn't at all the way I felt it for. I enjoyed the people that I was around, the teachers that I ran, and the coaches, like I said. To give you an, to give a story, a story and an example of the character of a, of a Lester Smith. As we, when they first came out with FM radios, two-way radios, the FM two-way radio, you know, a little portable thing, you didn't need the heads wire head headset. When they first came out, we got one, and uh, we were going to use it for our team. And so the, we was playing a team, I think, from Mobile. And Lester said, "Well, let's let's wait and see and make sure they don't have those." So you know. And so uh, we start the game, and it's not long until one of the assistants says, uh, "Coach, they're we're they're on that same channel we're on." And so Lester, here's the character of Lester. He says, all right, box ours up, put it in the box. We're not going to use it. Not, not so that, not to keep them from hearing us, but to keep us from hearing them. To, so we wouldn't have an, uh, uh, an advantage, you know, an illegal advantage, which it would be, you know. And so that's, that's the kind of person he is. He didn't want to 
he wanted to win, but not so bad that he'd do something illegal or immoral. So uh, that's the kind of guy he is, and he's a tremendous guy to work with. In the sixth grade, I had Miss Sybil Underwood. Uh, Miss Underwood um, later became a counselor at Foley for a number of years. Uh, the main the main event for me in the sixth grade was making a scrapbook. She asked us to make a scrapbook. And uh, that was very interesting uh, because I made the scrapbook. The cover of the scrapbook uh, actually was made out of wood. And um, I had um, uh, put polyurethane and that sort of thing on it and put, uh, I can't remember the title of the book, but uh, Foley Schools or Foley High School. And things that we had collected or the things that had happened to us uh, in the first uh, 11 or 12 years of our life, I guess. And so I collected a bunch of things and even kept that scrapbook uh, for years and even added to it uh, and still have the scrapbook today, 50-something years later. One of the teachers that was very memorable at that time also was Mr. Fuller, Olin Fuller. And I'll tell one story about Mr. Fuller. Uh, I had plain geometry under him in the 10th grade and Algebra 2 under him in the 11th grade. I had never had any problems uh, with math uh, prior to having Mr. Fuller. That's not to say that Mr. Fuller was not a good teacher because he was an excellent teacher, but it, it'll illustrate, I'll illustrate the point here in just a minute. Um, during the first um, six weeks, uh, we had six weeks at that time instead of nine weeks, but at the end of the first six weeks, I made a 43 in plain geometry. Well, I'd never made a 43 in anything before. I'd always been an A-B student pretty much uh, all, all the way through school. But Mr. Fuller, I guess, felt sorry for me and gave me a D minus because I had tried real hard. It was just very difficult for me to pick it up. Mr. Fuller covered the material pretty fast. As a matter of fact, uh, those of us who had him uh, would say, of course, we didn't say it to him, but uh, we would say from time to time, Mr. Fuller would write with one hand and erase with the other, you know, almost all at the same time. As a matter of fact, the plain geometry book, I still remember it. Uh, I remember numbers pretty well, and I remember the plain geometry book was 583 pages long, and he covered that book and still had three weeks left in school. So he covered the material pretty fast. So I made a D minus. Well, I, I wound up uh, making a D the first semester and a C the second semester in plain geometry and in algebra two. Uh, but 24 years later, the interesting thing is uh, he's still teaching at uh, Foley High School, and my son comes along now, Keith, the one that I, I mentioned a little bit ago. Keith is now a sophomore at Foley High School. Mr. Fuller is still teaching plain, plain geometry and algebra two. And I'm an assistant principal at that time at Foley. And when I found out that Keith had Mr. Fuller for plain geometry, I said, oh, no. Uh, now his grades are going to drop because Keith was an A student. He might have made a B once in a while, but uh, he made uh, mostly A's and uh, a B occasionally. And I said, well, here goes Keith's GPA. Well, at the end of the first uh, six weeks, uh, the report cards come out and Asked Keith, I said, well, how did you do? And he said, well, I did well. I said, well, how did you do in plain geometry? He said, well, I made an 89. And I said, well, how did you do that? He said, well, Mr. Fuller is a good teacher. And I said, I know Mr. Fuller is a good teacher. I had Mr. Fuller 24 years ago in 1959-60 in plain geometry. I said, I realize Mr. Fuller is a good teacher. He was a good teacher in 1959-60 also. But I said, you made an 89, and I made a 43, and I know that you're not twice as smart as I am. Of course, I found out later that Keith probably was, and probably still is, twice as smart as I am. But it's kind of an interesting story uh, from the standpoint of uh, Mr. Fuller being an outstanding teacher. It just so happened that, that I had a difficult time understanding plain geometry in second year algebra, and Keith didn't. Uh, there were other outstanding teachers um, in those days uh, at Foley as well. But I think the, uh, uh, the ones who maybe made the most um, impact on me, uh, even, even though certainly all of those teachers made a big impact on me in a, in a number of ways, uh, some that I recounted, and there are others that I just failed to mention at this point. Uh, maybe I can uh, recall them later on. But during those days, of course, uh, my main interest uh, in life really was sports. Um, I love playing football, basketball, and baseball, and we had some excellent uh, coaches uh, at Foley. 
Of course, the, the main one, the head coach at that time, was Coach Ivan Jones. Coach Jones uh, came to Foley. He had actually been an assistant coach uh, in the early 50s and then went back to Jackson for a year or so as an assistant coach and then came to Foley in 1955 as head coach. Of course, that was a wonderful time for us uh, because even though I think at that time I was in the fifth or sixth grade, later on I would have the opportunity to play for him for three years and uh, he was a big influence in my life at that time and even later on and even still today. Um, at that time we had outstanding football teams. Uh, he coached for 14 years, never had a losing team. And during that time, uh, there was a period which most people refer to, I guess, as the golden age of Foley football, at least at that time, uh, beginning in 1960 through about 1964. We won 47 games and lost three. In, in football, there are a lot of serious things, of course, and Coach Jones' practices were always exceptionally tough, hard, long. As a matter of fact, uh, we would always say, even when I played for him and coached for him later on, that we practiced a dark 30 every day. Uh, we, we started at 2.20 or 2.30 and it might be uh, 6 or 6.30 or whenever he decided we had enough. But uh, at any rate, uh, one thing that uh, happened one time, uh, there was a kid that uh, got his uh, nose hurt in practice and he was uh, coming over to Coach Jones, had come over to Coach Jones and said, um, Coach, I think I broke my nose. And he was holding his nose and, and saying, I think I broke my nose, I think I broke my nose. And so uh, Coach Jones, uh, who I had a way with words uh, with us guys, and, and we totally understood uh, what he wanted us to do in the years that I played for him and coached with him. But uh, Coach Jones uh, said, uh, son, um, uh, is that the same one that you broke last year? And so that was kind of a funny uh, uh, regarding Coach Jones. And Coach, don't kill me for uh, having said that. Uh, I haven't told that story. Uh, those kind of things happen from time to time, and um, uh, there was one other story that, uh, that I'll relate. And Coach Jones always believed in um, what was called board drills. We would have a, a, like a tube of 12. Uh, he coached offensive line a lot. He coached everything. He coached offensive line, backs, defense, everything. But uh, he believed in a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, stuff at practice. And, so he was teaching the lineman to block and to shed a block, get off the block and that sort of thing. And so uh, one day uh, the linemen were going one-on-one -on, -one, uh, on the boards. And there was a big hole next to the board. And so one of the boys told Coach Jones, uh, Coach Jones, uh, there's a, a big hole right here. He said, looked at the kid and just said, well, son, just leave it there. So these are the kind of things. Uh, those, those people that know Coach Jones uh, know that I'm telling that uh, with a lot of respect and admiration for Coach Jones. I'm not poking fun. It was just uh, funny kind of things that happen once in a while. Really and truly, uh, Foley and all of Baldwin Ball County, really, and education, it's about uh, relationships, uh, building relationships. It's about people. Uh, and it's about making a difference in people's lives. And people like that uh, uh, made a difference in my life. And, uh, and you get into the profession for that reason, really. And uh, I failed to mention a while ago even Coach Jones. Later on, I had the opportunity to coach his son, John. Uh, like he coached me, then I coached his son uh, years later. And even years later, Coach Jones uh, is helping my son coach. Uh, my son is coaching uh, right now. He coaches the Foley Middle School team and uh, has for several years. Uh, Coach Jones, at the age of 81, as I'm speaking today, he'll be 82 in about a month, uh, he's still helping coach. Uh, he goes out there every day and uh, helps my son Keith, uh, along with Rusty Henson and Kenny Thomason, uh, coach the Foley Middle School uh, football team. My days at Foley High School are too good to uh, ever begin to cover in such a short period of time. When uh, I attended Foley High School and 1962 through 1966, those are probably some of the greatest years uh, that anyone could ever have wanted to attend a high school. Foley High School was absolutely a, a fabulous place to be. Our class uh, consisted of 166 students and our students were just so close and to this day we're close. We've had five year reunions ever since we've graduated and are gonna celebrate our 60th birthdays together on a cruise 
uh, in the Gulf of Mexico out of Mobile because we're all so close to this day. I'm one of the fortunate class members to have fallen in love uh, with a beautiful cheerleader in Foley High School and still be married to the same lady uh, 37 years later. Uh, Sandy and I were classmates at Foley and I always tell the story. When I went to Foley High School, I wanted to be the valedictorian of the class and uh, I quickly found out with all the smart girls in there I couldn't be so I married the valedictorian of my class. <laughs> and. Uh, found out that's the easiest way, you know, or closest I could ever get. But Foley High School was truly a great um, school back then, and I guess the, one of the neatest things is is that we all were such close friends. And a lot of things focused around the athletics in the school because that was not just the school activity that garnered so much uh, interest, it was the community activity. So when the Foley High School team would play on a Friday night, almost every home game uh, we would have five to six thousand people. Uh, be standing standing room only. And the next day when the football players would come in to watch the films, afterwards we'd go to Wright's drugstore or Stacy's drugstore and the old timers in town would come in and talk to us about the game from the night before. Uh, I had the privilege of, of playing on four ranked state teams, uh, one state championship uh, one year. Uh, the next year we were third in the state, sixth in the state, and eighth in the state. And we lost four games um, in four years. So, so much centered around the sports activities and we just really enjoyed that aspect of the high school. Some of the funniest things that happened uh, also happened around high school and had the pleasure of playing football with uh, the pro athlete of the world, a guy named Kenny Stabler. A lot of people don't know that, but our Foley High graduate in 1964, Snake Stabler became the pro athlete of the world besides the Super Bowl champion athlete. And I remember one of the funniest things, one, some of the funniest things that happened, where Snake always had a way of uh, getting the rest of us in trouble. Uh, he was such a great athlete. Uh, he could get away with things the rest of us couldn't. And, he, when we'd be having these team meetings, there, was, there were only 38 of us on the team, uh, he'd sneak around behind Coach Jones and start making all these funny faces and everything while Coach Jones was so intently uh, lecturing us on pride and all of that and Snake would be back there, you know, and doing all these uh, gyrations and we'd have to be sitting there steadily looking at Coach Jones and I remember one day I just burst out laughing. I just couldn't hold it any longer. And Coach Jones, right then, made me break down and uh, do some uh, uh, agility right there and then run laps. I had to run 10 laps that, that particular day because of, of what Snake did. But one of the funniest football games that I'll always remember was going over to Viger. And back when we played football, we all got on one bus with our gear. Uh, we only took one bus. And several games, our head football coach Coach Jones drove the bus. And I'll never forget going to a Viger game one year on the old Causeway, and we were all scared to death. It's amazing we could play football after having ridden the, ridden the bus with Coach Jones driving because he was, he was a fabulous coach, but he was a, not a very good bus driver. And we were all on that bus, and we were going for this big game, and we were crossing the old Causeway Bridge that's so narrow, the steel bridge, and uh, he got so far over on the line that his, our bus mirror hit a, track, a trailer truck bus mirror and it went kapang like that and snake all around. He says, we had a wreck, we had a wreck, hit the floor. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we all hit the floor. I don't know why we did that and I don't know why snake told us to hit the floor because we, we were all perfectly safe. But we got, he drove a little further and Coach Jones pulled off the side of the road and uh, and he said, uh, boy, boys, j just settle down. We're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. <laughs> but th the other thing that was funny that happened back then is uh, Viger was such a competitor of ours, and unfortunately they, they beat us uh, a few times. But when we got over to the one year of the game, I'll never forget, and again, we were all on one bus and had our gear on there, Coach Jones made us put on our helmets and our uh, shoulder pads before we got off the <laughs> bus. And so the whole team starts getting off the bus. And as we're getting off the bus, walking up into the stadium, the Viger Stadium, we start hearing these ping, ping, ping. And we wonder what it is. And it was the rocks that the Viger fans 
were throwing at, our, throwing at us, and they were hitting our helmets and bouncing off. And he, he got us over there, and they didn't provide us with a, a dressing room. We just had to huddle out there. And he got us down there, and he kind of started breaking down. He said, boy, I told you this is why you need to have your headgear on, because you never know when some foreign object <laughs> might come flying at you. <laughs> and uh, it was like, uh, I mean, I'll just never forget that as long as I live. And that, I, that probably is one of the reasons we... We never could beat Biger because Coach Jones had us so psyched up. <laughs> but uh, anyways. <laughs> That's why you, you'll never forget uh, the, the memories of playing football with Coach Jones and also Coach Hollis. Uh, we had a coach named Iron Man Tompkins. And uh, I think Snake named him Iron Man because he was the first coach that we had that really taught us how to use weights. Coach Jones, we didn't have the weight machines back then. Coach Jones believed in the actual old weights, and Iron Man Topkins came in from Troy. He never said a word, and he was quite muscular, and he really made us work out with weights. And, and of course, Snake never worked out with weights, and, and wisely so, because he was the quarterback, but he would always be there cheering us on as we worked out. But we had Coach Hollis. Coach Hollis was, by the way, you hear a lot of stories, Coach Hollis is the one that, that gave the nickname the Snake Stabler. Uh, as he weaved through that game, uh, was so remarkable. He's the one that named him Snake. And we had Coach Kelly. Uh, and and, uh, and fortunately, uh, we still have all our coaches still living from high school, which is a great memory for us. The athletic field today is still adjacent to the middle school campus uh, building today. And recently, the community requested that the school board name the stadium for Coach Ivan Jones. Anyone who has gone to school in Foley or lived in Foley or knows anybody from Foley knows of the heritage that Ivan Jones has created in the Foley Public School Athletic Program. When I came in 1952, I coached the uh, junior high basketball and out of the uh, those eight and ninth graders, uh, I think we had 12 kids on the uh, you know roster that played in the championship game of the junior high championship, and uh, they were juniors and seniors. Uh, we had we had 11 of them playing football county. I mean on the football team, and out of this 11. Six of them played college, uh, and two of them later played pro football. Uh, Bobby Lauder played at Auburn. Uh, Billy Walker went to Alabama. Uh, Bubba Merritt went to Troy. Uh, Richard Worth and Raymond Christensen went to uh, Southeastern uh, uh, Mississippi Junior College, I mean, and uh, Danny Mastrine also uh, played junior college ball and later at a, at a school in Louisiana. Uh, this this uh, was the nucleus of the 1955 team, the first year that I became head head coach, which we, we, we had a great year, went nine and one, Viger beat us, but we ca later came back and beat McGill, uh, who, who were the city champions of Mobile here on this field. And that was, uh, uh, was a, you know, a real great, great year. And uh, also beginning in, in, uh, from, through, from 1960 through 64, we went 47 out of 50, which uh, was a great run. We had two undefeated seasons, 1961 and two, and three nine and one seasons, and uh, was some had some great kids, and uh, we had uh, uh, off of the '61 team. Uh, I think we had about four or five kids to sign Division One scholarships. And we had, and we had off the 62 team, 
we had several more to sign, uh, which was a great, two great uh, classes, right, you know, right, right together. And uh, I guess they are the most famous or, or renowned from the standpoint of, uh, of course, Kenny Stabler was on the 61 and 62 team and was a quarterback. Lester Smith was a quarterback on the 61 team and Kenny was, uh, was on the 62 and 63 ball, ball club. And uh, those, uh, and of course we, we also had some, uh, you know, fond memories of, of the other teams and we're not, uh, we, but that, those two classes, 61 and two, probably uh, as far as talent, all being in one right together is probably the most talent that I that I had during that uh, that time. But uh, uh, had many uh, 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 other teams. Of course, in, in, in basketball, we I think in 1957, uh, uh, 58. The uh, the basketball team was seated number one in in the, in the uh, district here, and uh, we've had uh, several several teams to, you know to make the uh, playoffs in in baseball, and and as long as I was coaching, we we, we did not well they they started the. Uh, Football playoffs. I think it was the last year that I that I coached, and, and at that time, I believe it was only four teams from the whole state that got that got to go to the uh, state. And of course, Fairhope was one of those, and and we tied Fairhope that year the last for the uh, for the county for the county, and uh, uh, of course. Many uh, many more teams go go today, but it's, it's, it has really really grown. Uh, probably one of the best things that uh, we ever uh, did here, or Coach Coach Wyatt started, was this, I think it was the second year I was here. We started a track. He started a track program, which helped helped. Uh, I, I helped uh, helped a lot, and then about a lot, at the same time, we uh, Mr. Uh, L. W. Brannon gave uh, gave us a set of weights, and uh, Coach Wise had them, you know, all welded together on one time, and and uh, and that was the beginning of the weight program. Here at Foley High School, I, I was um, about 1953 or four. That uh, I know, he, Mr. Brown, and I think gave them to us in 1953. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, you should see the weight program that they have today. The equipment and down at the high school, it's 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 really really something to to see. And uh, I think football has changed a lot in some ways. Back then, we we're definitely uh, a more pass-oriented, uh, and we we used to. But uh, of course, Stabler did a pretty good job uh, when he was was here. As also, Coach Smith was a great a great passer, and mentioned uh, Bubba Married, who was one of the. Uh, Six off of that basketball team went to uh, went to to the New York, played at Troy, and made little All American. Went to Troy, and uh, from there he was drafted by the New York uh, Giants, and he spent a couple of years with them, and later wound up with the Canadian uh, in the Canadian Football League with Toronto, I believe, and. Uh, so we've had two professional quarterbacks from 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 Foley, which I was privileged to coach in high school. 
getting back to uh, Stabler, I, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of people want to know how he got the name uh, Snake. Uh, when he was a, uh, fr I believe, freshman, a sophomore here, uh, he was playing in a, a, a game and he ran, by, he ran back a punt or a play like that and he weaved you know, all down the field. He must have, uh, must, have, must have had about 60 yards for a touchdown, but he must have run close to 100 just weaving from in and out. And then Coach Hollis at that time, who was the junior high coach, said, uh, he looks like a snake, and it just and it just stuck after then. Uh, you know, the kid, kidding him about looking like a snake. So uh, that's that's how that story originated. I guess the advice uh, I have to I guess to well teachers, coaches, administrators, or what what have you. Uh, uh, an educator told me one time. Uh, about the kids coming up, uh, says, be nice to them. You may meet them on the way, uh, on the way back down. If you're on the top of the mountain, you may meet them on the way back down. And of course, uh, I try to treat everybody fairly, you know, with respect, and uh, you know, uh, encourage them every way I can. We in football, I mean. We used to say uh, we wanted you to be a competitor on the field and also in the classroom because uh, my high school coach used to say you can't eat it once you get through, and uh, which I think is a lot of a lot of truth in that. And uh, you know, use it as a, a stepping stone instead of a, an end in itself. I was born and raised in Foley. Uh, my father was chief of police there for 34 years, so that made life rather interesting, not to mention school. Um, but when I went to school in first grade, I had Miss Southern. It was her very first year to teach. She was right out of college, and the thing I remember most about Miss Southern, aside from growing to love her, was that she gave me my one and only spanking in school. And she popped me in the hand one day for talking during rest period. I don't think that I really ever quit talking, but I cried forever the day that she spanked me, and I never got another spanking. Um, and of course, went to Foley Elementary School for six years. Um, in third grade, I had Miss Bryant for a teacher. The thing I remember about Miss Bryant she was very strict on us, but she walked up and down the hall and carried a yardstick. And, and we were petrified of her, just petrified. But she was an excellent, excellent teacher. Of course, I really wanted to be in Miss Knowles' room because Miss Knowles played the piano and the kids got to sing every day. And since I loved music more than anything, that's what I wanted. Instead, I had Miss Bryan, and I can tell you I learned a great deal of math. Um, excellent teacher. In the fourth grade, I think, was not too eventful. In the fifth grade, we had a teacher named Miss Miller. And the most memorable thing about fifth grade was learning to square dance. And, and the first time that we did a play. We did a um, Thanksgiving play that she had written. And then, of course, we did sort of a shortened version of a Christmas carol at um, at Christmas time, and I fell in love with drama in fifth grade, uh, thanks to Miss Bryant. The thing I remember the most about sixth grade, I had a teacher named Miss Griffiths, and Miss Griffiths introduced us to cultural education in the sixth grade that we had to learn about all different countries. And one day we had the most fascinating story on Mexico, and she taught us all the stuff about their history, but as well as she taught us about their foods. And she introduced us to this dish called fried bananas. 
I thought that would be just the greatest thing in the world. I mean, I loved bananas, and who wouldn't like them fried, right? So a friend of mine and I went home that afternoon. We took a banana. We peeled it. We put Crisco in a frying pan and attempted to fry bananas. They were awful. They were absolutely awful. We told Miss Griffiths the next day of, of what we had tried to do and how terrible the food was. And she said if we had done it appropriately, we would have enjoyed it. But I must admit that to this day, I've really never tried fried bananas again. <laughs> um, in the seventh grade, um, our lives really changed because in, at Foley, in seventh grade, you went over to the high school campus. And seventh through the twelfth grade was all on one big campus. And even though you were, I guess, somewhat considered junior high, you really were a part of the whole school. So you intermingled with the older students who were seniors, juniors, sophomores, um, eight at the same time. And those older students began to have a big influence on your life. Um, and we started thinking, I think, at that time more seriously about the kinds of impact our teachers were having. In the seventh grade, we, were, we had Miss Lawrence as a science teacher. And there was a very old building on the Foley High School campus at that time that was up on the front corner. It was a big two-story building. And the seventh and eighth grade classes were in that building. And uh, so we had seventh grade science in that building um, with Miss Lawrence, who um, had considered on one day not allowing us to do an experiment because we had a tendency to blow things up, which we'd already done once or twice. But um, she, uh, of course, let us do the experiment, but she did warn us that we needed to stop blowing things up. Um, the other thing I remember a lot about that two-story building was that um, the arts were taught there as well, music and, and art. And Coach Jones' wife, Julia, who was Julia Bristow at the time, was new to our school and she was teaching art in one of the rooms there. And it wasn't a matter of just taking rulers and, and construction paper and creating you know, tiny little things. She really had them with easels and huge art pads and was really teaching people to draw and it was quite fascinating to be introduced to all that. Um, Mr. Stoddard, Ted Stoddard, taught chorus in that building and I really liked uh, Mr. Stoddard and remember him well. Um, a girlfriend of mine, her name was Cheryl Jackson at the time, Cheryl Lowry, and she and I made the varsity chorus the year we were in the um, seventh grade. Uh, we had to try out for it, and we were so proud of ourselves because we could sing good enough to be with the varsity chorus. And it was a great experience, and, and music has stayed with me the rest of my life, and I, and I attribute that to the experiences that I had at Foley High School and the music teachers there. Um, also in that uh, two-story building, there was a band. Um, I never did sign up for band. I just recall it being very loud while we were trying to sing over it. But it was a great old building, um, and we had, uh, we had a lot of um, enjoyment in that building. And I was sorry the year that it had to be torn down, and they built the library on that campus now, where that old building used to, to uh, stand. But it was fun to sit out on the building. It had huge steps had a great architecture style, and, and we used to sit out on those steps, and I remember those days. In the seventh grade, we also had a teacher named Miss Newman. She was an English teacher. Once you had Miss Newman, you never needed grammar or sentence mechanics or punctuation ever again, and indeed I didn't. She taught us grammar in the seventh grade, and I mean really taught us, and you had to know it. And if you were cutting up or you were not paying attention, and this never happened to me, thank goodness, but she would walk around up and down the rows and look at what you were doing, and if you were off task or you were not doing your lesson right, she would grab the ear of the student and pull on it. And I remember one day she pulled the ear of a boy in front of me, and I just remember thinking, ooh, I don't ever want to do what it, ever, what it was he was doing. <laughs> So, uh, but she was an excellent teacher, and we really learned a lot from her, and she was very influential in my life. She and another English teacher that I had my senior year, her name was Catherine Jones, and Miss Jones made literature come alive in her class. 
Um, it was as if the characters in the stories got up and walked around the room. And I attribute the fact that I became an English teacher to both Miss um, Newman and Miss Jones because they, they taught us not only to appreciate it and what the written word could do, but the enjoyment that it could bring. And I thought, that is really the job of a teacher. And it was what I wanted to do once I became a teacher. I wanted to, to get the lesson across, to understand the need and the seriousness of it, but at the same time, to teach my students to learn to enjoy it because it could bring so much to you you know, the rest of your life. Reading is not something you do just as a student. You do that for enjoyment and for um, self-growth throughout your life. And so I wanted to do that for my students, and that's one of the reasons I became a teacher. If I only had to name one teacher in high school that made the biggest impression on me, I would have to say that it was Beverly Manick. Ms. Manick was the PE teacher, and she entered our lives the year we went into the seventh grade. And this was the early 60s. I graduated from Foley in 1967. So I would say that Ms. Manick entered our, our lives around 60 or 61. And she began, and of course at that time, the PE classes were segregated. All the girls were in one class and all the boys in another. So um, Ms. Manick just had girls. And she really began to teach us in the early 60s how to have aspirations for your life other than perhaps what had been expected of women in the past. And through that PE class, where she accepted no excuse for you not participating or not dressing out or not playing or going outside. I mean, if we said to Ms. Manick, oh, it's too cold, we can't go outside, she said, we're going outside anyway. If, she said, if we said to Ms. Manick, well, I just don't feel very good today, I don't think I want to participate in PE, she said, get up on the floor, you're participating anyway. And although that may have seemed harsh, she actually introduced us to a period of time and to a learning experience of not making excuses or not because you were a woman or a lady. And she then began to instill in us the fact that even though we were young women, we could do anything we wanted to do in our lives. And she talked to us about going to college. She talked about careers that had in the past normally been held by men and told us that if we aspired to those professions, then go to college or go to technical school or go wherever that we needed to go to get the skill necessary to do the job and then do it. And so we began to be very unafraid and, and very bold in what we thought we would do with our future. Certainly, perhaps not every girl did, but I know I did. And she influenced me greatly in that regard. Um, and is another strong reason that I became a teacher. Um, I taught for 21 years in the classroom and upon the retiring of Lester Smith, who was principal at the time, um, the assistant principal, uh, or the principal at the middle school, Mr. Pettibone, became the principal at Foley High School then, which left an assistant principal position open. And Mr. Pettibone came to me because he knew I had the degree and asked me if I wanted to be an assistant principal. And I don't mind telling you that I was petrified at first at the thought because in a high school in Bowen County at that time, we'd never had a woman assistant principal. And I thought, you know, this is a very challenging job. This is a very demanding job. But I will tell you that my mind also flashed back to the days of Beverly Manick and those PE classes of being told, you prepare yourself to do a job and then you do it. 
And so I told Mr. Pettibone, yes, I thought I wanted to do the job. And um, I began that job and I really loved it. I was a, an assistant principal then for four years at Foley. And after leaving there, I became principal at Fairhope High School for seven years. And um, then in um, 04, was promoted to this position, assistant superintendent. And I will tell you that in each of those positions in Baldwin County, I was the first woman to ever hold them. The first woman to be an assistant principal at a high school, the first woman to be a principal of a high school, and the first woman to be an assistant superintendent of a, a large region in the school system. And, um, and although, you know, I certainly feel fortunate and blessed to have had the opportunity I was also very fortunate to have the support and the teachers in the past that gave me the direction and the confidence to, uh, to pursue those kinds of things, and I, I attribute that to them. When I was a student, I think, too, as far as some really lighthearted things that go, one of the funniest things that I remember uh, about Foley High School, uh, which was full of tradition. Everything about Foley High School was full of tradition. There was a particular time when you um, were allowed to participate in certain events. And a particular time when you had reached an age, you were allowed to go to a particular dance. And um, there was also a very big tradition around becoming a senior. <clears throat> and believe it or not, that tradition was referred to as Kids Day. It was the last day seniors of a class were on campus in school and, and they really weren't there the whole day because you came to school dressed like a kid much younger with your bathing suit on underneath we loaded into huge pickup trucks and any other kind of truck that could haul us all and our senior sponsors and teachers and we went down to Gulf Shores for a day at the beach and we stayed all day long now we had a, a place on Foley High School's campus that, was, that we always had that was called Senior Lawn. And it was a grassy area in the very center of the school and nobody could walk on it but seniors. And if an underclassman stepped on it then they got hit with a book for every boy that was standing on the Senior Lawn at the time or something like that. <clears throat> but while, we, while the seniors were away at Kids Day, the juniors um, actually took possession of the senior lawn and became the next class. We had another sport at Foley High School which I think enticed everybody to join. That is the field day sports, which they had a, an opportunity for all uh, students to participate. And one of them was kidding get out of the bar and chin up and down. And uh, that was one of the main sports that I entered into all the time and see how many times you could chin. And uh, I believe 32 was the like most that we had anybody do. Uh, but the school activities was one of the main places to enjoy your t uh, time here in Foley. So, uh, you had to pay a tuition fee when I went to school. I don't know about Austin, but I went to school. And the only way we could pay that tuition was we'd have to haul wood to the school in order to heat the school. They didn't have natural gas or uh, any other way. It was all heated by wood. And so we paid our tuition that way by bringing logs and so forth, cutting them up, bring them down there so they could eat the school. And also they didn't have buses. And we lived about three miles out of school, out of Felder. And we had to walk to school. And by the good nature of the fellow by the name of Judge Stelk, who engineered a lot of the property in real estate sales here, his son went to school, had an old Model T Ford, and he would pick up much of a bunch of the people on the road to come to school. And that's the only transportation we really had coming to school. Remember that? 
And uh, also, uh, another thing, there was a little creek across the road, it was a dirt road, and a little creek between our home and a, and a road highway, 59, which was not paved. But uh, going through the creek, going to school was kind of odd, so we had to take off our shoes and socks and wade through the creek and when it was raining and then put our shoes and socks back on so we could walk the rest of the way. But we did that, born left going to school for several years. I went to school with a two-story building, which they had classes in the first floor and classes in the second. And I believe it was through the sixth, sixth grade that these classes were held in this two-story building in the front. Then after that, they had the other schools on the side, but uh, my, uh, my wife's aunt happened to be the sixth grade teacher at that time, and uh, I did, of course, I didn't know that at the time, but I, later on I found that out. And uh, she was quite interesting in, in all of her conversations about school, but I think the most interesting thing is we had a teacher from Atmore, Alabama, by the name of McLennan. And one thing she always had, she had her glasses, and she always would take them and put them up. And she always got us to sing songs in class when we started class. And uh, it was quite interesting, but she was a wonderful lady. Uh, other than that, I got our Latin teacher, which is not ever mentioned in the book, was Addie Townsend, and she taught us Latin. And it's quite interesting, too, that we learn to speak Latin, or interpret Latin, more or less in that respect. Um, and other was uh, Lou Alexander, Louise Alexander, and about well, oh, about 10 years ago, no more than that, about 30 years ago, someone called me and said, somebody wants to see you. And she was traveling through here, and she came into the office where I was working and said, you don't probably remember me, do you? I said, I don't know. She said, well, I was your English teacher. And I was quite interested. She was just traveling through. I came to Foley High School when I was in the ninth grade. I was born in Indiana. We moved down to Pedro Beach, and uh, they finally got a school bus. My dad had to bring us up here the first year and stay all day long and wait on us to get out of school and take us back home. But we finally got a school bus, and uh, like Paul said, or one of you said before, our bridge kept breaking down. It was all dirt roads then. The bridge kept breaking down, and we had to take our shoes off and wade across the water. My dad would bring us up to meet the bus in the car, and then we'd wade across the water to get to school, dry our feet off and put our shoes back on. Then he'd meet the bus every afternoon when it came back, but we only did that for a couple of weeks till they fixed the bridge. But when I came to Foley School, I went to the building that's there now that's the intermediate school, and uh, that was our high school. And like they, somebody else said, our biggest day was Armistice Day, when we had Armistice Day, because Bay Minette was the only county and the only city in the county that had a band. And of course, that was just great for us to have a band, because everything we had, we didn't have a band for it. There was a boy named, uh, oh, I forgot his name now, Baron Field that started a Foley band later, but we didn't have a band then. And uh, there wasn't any lights at the football field, so of course all the games were played in the daytime. And uh, our biggest day was Armistice Day Parade when we had our homecoming. We crowned our homecoming queen. And uh, J.W. Crosby was the first one to ever announce the football games. And then we had stands that were about three feet high, and he walk back and forth between the stands in the dirt and announce the football games. 
his graduating class in 1939 gave the, him a PA system, and, uh, but there wasn't any place to plug it in. So he had to go across the alley, the man's house, Gene Lenz's house, and plug in his PA system to announce the games. And uh, I was a cheerleader, so that's how we met, and we finally married later. But he ended up announcing games for over 60 years at the high school. And uh, that was our biggest day. But the brick building is still there was our home economics building. And uh, Mrs. Terrell, Louise Terrell, was our home economics teacher. And uh, we cooked and sewed and did everything over there. One day, one week out of the year, we'd exchange with the boys. Half the building was agricultural building. So we'd go in the agriculture building and we'd have to make something. And uh, they'd have to go over to our building and do some sewing. So all the boys used to laugh about different things that they made out of cloth over at the agriculture building. But it was a real, real active, it's a big class. We were all standing in the hall one day changing classes when they announced World War II over the loudspeaker. And uh, almost all the boys were drafted out of our class. I don't think there was half of them left. So after the war, they told them that they could all come back and go to school and they could graduate for two or three months. And I know a lot of them that did that. And they got their diploma from high school. About two or one, of, one boy I was talking to, Clifford Calloway, just got his, his diploma a couple of years ago. He's my, he's my 80, he's my age. <laughs> so they, a lot of them did come back and get the diplomas that didn't. But they were drafted out of high school. They were seniors and weren't allowed to graduate. I, I started Foley High School in, in 1931. And, and uh, of course, there weren't many paved roads around town at that time or anything else, uh, really. And, and of course, we're sitting in this, in this wonderful building today that's been here at the depot as long as I can remember because I was born about 300 feet across the street from the depot. And, and uh, my father had a general store at the main intersection of Foley. And we lived upstairs there. And so uh, we weren't too far from the high school in Foley. And, and uh, I've seen a lot of changes in South Baldwin County and, and uh, particularly in the school system. And I, I remember back when, when the early days when uh, Mr. Lewis was principal, uh, uh, Mr. Lewis, and then, then later on after Mr. Lewis, why, uh, yep. Mr. O.P. South uh, was principal of Foley School, and, and uh, l later on, why, Mr. Bennett, uh, before Mr. South was Mr. Fraley. He followed Mr. Lewis. Mr. Fraley uh, followed, followed Mr. Uh, Lewis and, and then Mr. Percy South, O.P. South, and a, after that was Mr. Bennett. Mr. Bennett died while, I guess about 1940 or a little before that, and Mr. Hadley uh, moved down from, Dr. Hadley was principal of Somerdale, like Mr. Bennett. Mr. Bennett was Somerdale and then he moved to Foley and and of course, then Mr. Hadley, after Mr. Bennett's death, Mr. Hadley was principal at Foley. And later, later on, of course, uh, after Mr. Hadley was Mr. McGowan and W. C. McGowan, and and of course, uh, uh, Les Leslie Smith, I guess, followed Mr. McGowan. Likewise, Mr. McGowan was superintendent after. Mr. Tharp, Mr. S. M. Tharp, the superintendent of Baldwin County Education. But my father uh, not only served on the school board here in Foley, or he served on the county school board for I don't know how many years, but until Max Griffin took his place. 
in Baldwin County School System. And, and my mother used to be real active in the PTA. And that was a big thing uh, back in the early days uh, was the Parents Teachers Association. And uh, that's when everyone in town just about turned out to see what was happening at the school. The, the school was really the main function of the whole community in the early days of, uh, in all the communities, I would say. But if anything went on, it was all, all the meetings were held at the schoolhouse or in the auditoriums at the school. And uh, that was our entertainment, whether it was baseball or basketball or football. I transferred to Foley High School from Monsecure in um, the late 30s. And we left Monsecure School in the seventh grade and went to Foley in the eighth. Uh, immediately, I was just loved by everybody, I felt. And I uh, was so happy to be there. We had lockers. We only didn't have that in Monsecure. And it was just a new, uh, new area to become acquainted with. At first, I did not like being in one room and then another room. But it was a exciting time. I was nominated to be in the beauty pageant, not knowing really what the beauty pageant was, and that was, I won. I uh, met this gentleman. He was sitting across the road, a young student, was sitting across the room from me, and uh, he could wiggle the top of his forehead. It was very intriguing to me. And of course, he became the husband of my seven children and also a hero at Foley High School in football. He could run faster than anybody, and I don't believe anybody's beat his record. He was uh, uh, the love of my life, and uh, I entered, they entered me in the contest another time at the Foley High School, and I won as a beauty queen again. The girls, could, if they could get an evening gown, anybody could be uh, in the beauty pageant. So it, to really say that wasn't too much of a uh, exciting thing to know that you were there with all these girls. But anyway, it was exciting to me in my lifetime and my children. I have seven children, and they all went to Foley High School, cheerleaders, head cheerleaders, captains of the cheerleaders, and the son played football like his daddy. And he was also very fast and very good football player. Uh, the years went on, and I had my seven children to keep me happy and involved in the school. Always a homeroom mother. They said I made good cookies. And then uh, we had a new school built in Foley, and we had a great two-day or whole week celebration for it. And I was the uh, president and chairman of this celebration. Gould Beach had thought that he was the one that thought it would be a great thing to do. And so we had, Foley was just, had parades and the alumni parade, and we had uh, cars, bands of former students, and we all came together on the night of the dedication and the day of the dedication of the new school which is an asset and a beauty here in Foley. Uh, one of the funny things that I think would be interesting in Foley was my brother-in-law was seven years old and there was no school buses to come to uh, bring the children to school. So his father had a Model A or T and he would drove that bus with his brothers and sisters to school every day. And it's been told that he would get out there at recess and make donuts on the playground. So, you know, just imagine what would happen today if a seven-year-old got in a car and even was sitting in it at the school. So, I have to tell you, I was leaving my part out. I was the captain of the cheerleaders for two years. I, uh, uh, we were, we were orange and blue at the time of the uh, 1920s because this, the yearbook was called the Satsuma. There, we raised Satsumas in this area before the trees were frozen. 
And uh, so it was called Satsuma. The school, as you know, was also called the Baldwin County Agriculture School or something similar to that. But uh, we were very proud that we became, during the war, I was told the reason we couldn't get the color orange because of the parachutes used the color. And we became blue and gold. In 1927, I sat in what is now the uh, gift horse and watched my brother graduate from high school. The, it was called the Progressive Hall, Progressive Hall when it was built. And uh, all activities were there. Even the basketball games were played in the Progressive Hall. The school used it as an auditorium. And uh, it was an exciting time. And I know it was May the 25th in 1927 because when I got home, I had a baby sister. So I've never forgotten that that was the uh, happy time there in that hall. After that, it was, um, a, it was still used for the basketball games, and my brother had received a scholarship from Auburn to go play basketball. But you can imagine what was happening in 29 and 28 and 27. We had the Depression. My father owned the Standard Oil business in Foley, and people couldn't pay him for gas, so that he couldn't send my uh, brother to Auburn. He went to work for the U.S. Corps of Engineers. But those were the things that I remember about the uh, basketball. It was before the football. When they finally started the football uh, team, my brother went from business and business and asked for a donation so they could get helmets and uh, to wear for the football team because they were playing barefooted and with no helmet. And his coach said, you take that $5 he gave you back. He needs it worse than we do. So they played football with no helmets and no shoes. Glad to be a football player. So that was the beginning of the football team in Foley in 1926, I imagine, because he graduated in 27. But the other tale about him, he wanted to go to Foley School from Botsecure, and there was no bus. So there was a bus on the, this other side of the river, so he asked the bus driver could he and Dwight Steele go to school in Foley and ride the bus. He said, I have no room, but if you want to ride the running boards, I'll let you go. Well, my brother rode a horse up to Steele's Landing, rode a boat across the river, and caught the bus to come to Foley High School. He's the one that played basketball and won the scholarship. So there's so many little things like that, like my sister going to Foley School. My daddy uh, rented a room, and she and a, a friend lived in the room to go to school. Now, this is between 23 and 27. I think she graduated in 25. And they had a pot-bellied stove and my daddy brought them wood because they had to cook on it and heat with it to go to school in Foley. So you know, it wasn't so easy to be a student and go to school at Foley High School in 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. About the worst thing I can think of school, we had, it was so free in Foley School at the time that a Seven-year-old could drive a car. Uh, we could use the bus to go to our events. Gas was so cheap, I guess. We could, uh, uh, we were just almost free to be free with each other on the playgrounds or anything like that. I will tell you something, though, that my husband, that was the hero football player, uh, I was so in love with him that my family wanted me to go with other boys and not be one. And so there was this young man, he, his daddy was a mail carrier and he had a car and uh, he, he was so, oh, everybody didn't go just, he asked people to go with us. We double dated because of the transportation, double dated, triple dated and we could go and have a 
drink for a nickel, that's all we cared about, hot dog for a nickel somewhere. But anyway, uh, my husband didn't have the money to go to the show one day, and so uh, this young man asked me to go to the show with him. And when he came back, we rounded the big auditorium, and Cecil was standing there. He beat him up <laughs> on the, at the school. I don't think anything ever came of it except that they just laughed about it. And that's why I said we were so free in those days at Foley High School that I and my children, I hate to tell them how it was. And we had to break our lunch. There was no cafeteria. There was no place to buy a drink. You drank water. And we were happy to do that. There was, uh, uh, everybody had the, ate their lunches in the rooms. And so it was just a, I guess that it was one thing, we were so close to each other and knew each other and probably 50 graduated <laughs> at that time, maybe not even that many, that we were like a family there at Foley High School. pleasant memories of Foley. The, the, people, the people there were so supportive. And I had some unique opportunities there. As a teacher in high school, I was able to pick up children that I had previously taught in the fifth grade at Alberta before World War II. And I was able to take those kids at the junior high level, and then in those seven years, I went up in the teaching structure. I started out teaching junior high school math and science, and I wound up teaching senior high school math and science with those same kids, some of whom I had taught at the fifth grade level, and then again at the junior high, and then each year as they went up, I was able to take those kids through high school. It was an opportunity that few teachers ever have to take a kid from fifth grade through advanced mathematics and physics in high school. And those children became my personal friends to whom I was closer than to people of my own age. And it has remained that way uh, through all the years when we go back to the high school class reunions. These are uh, my personal friends. kids coming up I says be nice to them you may meet them on the way uh, on the way back down if you're on the top of the mountain you may meet them on the way back down and of course uh, I try to treat everybody fairly you know with respect and, uh, you know uh, encourage them every way I can with uh, football I mean, we used to say uh, we wanted you to be a competitor on the field and also in the classroom because uh, my high school coach used to say you can't eat it once you get through. <laughs> 